Kelly, thank you so much for being here today. We're so grateful that we get to interview you. I would love if you could introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Courtney. I'm I'm so happy to be here as well. So my name is Ellie Shoja. I'm a writer, obviously. And it's interesting. The interesting thing with me is that I write in multiple genres. And sometimes I get that question of, well, can you write in more than one genre? Do you have to like write in your thing? And and I write in multiple genres and I do it really well. When I write for myself, I like to write fantasy, science fiction. You know, I have a sci-fi novel uh, called The 13th Planet. Uh, and I also write uh, more like spiritual self-help type things. And, and I ghost write for people. I ghost write for celebrities. And when I do that, it's a lot of uh, personal development or memoir type things. Uh, and I write screenplays. So um, the <laughs> you didn't ask the question, but I have been asked the question, can you write in multiple genres? Absolutely. Uh, and you can do it well as well. And you can make a career writing in multiple genres as well. Love that so much. I would love if you could tell us more about what your books are about. Yes, of course. Uh, my novel, is called The 13th Planet. And it's essentially end of the world type things. It takes, I call it soft sci-fi because it takes place in the present time. It could actually, as you're reading it, it could be happening right now. Who knows? There's alien living among us for over 3000 years. And and, uh, their goal is to make sure Earth awakens, goes through this, um, goes through the evolutionary process of awakening, which means it becomes conscious, right? It becomes fully actualized. And uh, we have a a human protagonist who is a very annoying character. You will want to punch him in the face, but he does get involved with these aliens and goes on this incredible adventure of trying to figure out who is trying to sabotage this plan of you know, making sure Earth awakens and for what purpose, why, and how do they stop them? And I don't know, Earth might end by the end of the book. So you have to read it to find out. Love that. What inspired you to write your book? Where does inspiration actually come from? right? It's who knows it. uh, You wake up one day, you have a scene in your head, you have an idea in your head and uh, you catch the tail of it and you pull, you tug at it until it turns into, into a thing. So this uh, concept came to me and then it started unfolding uh, into scenes, into characters, into dialogue. And uh, and honestly, the, you know, Stephen King says uh, he's not a writer, he's a transcriber. And and I think that a lot of writers feel that way. We feel like, uh, well, the story was kind of presented to me and it was given to me by some force outside of us, right? And And my job is then to translate it into words in some way. And, uh, and that's, I think... W- where it came from, how it started is is essentially that process of catching it in the ether, catching it as a as a kernel, and then dwelling on it long enough for it to turn into into a thing, into multiple scenes, into characters, into a storyline. and uh, and 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 I find that that's the process of writing is the process of, sitting with those kernels long enough, watering them and and nurturing them until they turn into something. Love that. When you were writing your book, who were you thinking of when it comes to who your book is for? The first person that the book is for is is me. (laughs) So this book in particular, uh, it was an itch. I needed to scratch. I've written other books where uh, I, I start with, especially the non um, nonfiction, the personal development types books that I write. 
I start with the problem that the audience that my reader is facing and the problem that we want to solve for them. Uh, this book did not begin like that. This book was, oh, I, I can see this world in this specific way and I want to capture it and I want to communicate it. Amazing. How long have you been writing and what made you really sit down and start? What an excellent question. I've been writing my whole life. I've essentially been, uh, I grew up moving around a lot. I lived in Germany, Iran, and Turkey before I moved to the U.S. at the age of 15. And every country I lived in, everything, everywhere that I traveled, the one through line was that I had a notebook under my arm. And, and I would always be writing. I'd write poetry. I'd write stories. I'd write scenes all in the language that I was uh, learning at the time. And it was my escape. It was the thing that kept me sane in the middle of a very uh, kind of tumultuous life experience. And uh, it was the uh, it was the thing that I you know that that I found a lot of solace and relief in. So I read and I wrote. That was like the constant thing that I always always did. Now, being an immigrant, I never thought that writing could be a career path because when you grow up an immigrant um, or lower economic status, uh, the thing that you are kind of good at becomes your hobby. And, and the conversation is always around, okay, so Ellie likes writing and she's good at it. Do that on the side and get a real job. So I always felt like I had to have a real job, which I did. I, I, I always did different things uh, to make money. And then my divorce in my early 30s happened and I decided, you know what? I've always wanted to be a writer. I've always written and I'm going to give myself permission to actually go for it. And that was a huge turning point in my life because that's the moment I realized no one outside of me has to give me permission to write. I have to give me permission to write. And when I took that, that's that's when the entire trajectory of my life started to change. I realized, first of all, that most people don't like writing. Most people like to hire writers and are, are really not good at it themselves. So it's a skill that's very much in demand. So I, immediately I started making money as a as a writer. And, um, and then that was very inspiring. And then I wrote my books. And then I uh, started ghostwriting for other people. And now I do book coaching. So now I actually help people bring their books to life. That's so amazing. What is your schedule like when you are writing a book? I write every single day, seven days a week. So that's, uh, to be a writer is to be confused most of the time. That is literally your job description is to be confused. Now, what counters the confusion of being a writer is two things that I've discovered. One is clarity the second one is momentum. Without clarity and momentum, life will always get in the way of your book. It'll always get in the way of your writing. So I create clarity in a lot of different ways and I create momentum by staying consistent, right? So it's, it's a very important part of the writing process. So every single day uh, I have, uh, I set a small goal for my daily writing, 250 words. That's all I have to accomplish uh, to say that I have written today. Now, what happens is some days that 250 words is going to take me an hour. <laughs> it's going to take me three hours and it's going to feel like I'm literally pulling teeth, right? But I do that one day. I do that the next day, the next day, day four, the water starts to flow and suddenly I have a thousand words. And then the next day, I'm at 2,500 words. The next day, I'll write 3,000 words. And then it starts to trickle back down to, oh, it's it's hard again, right? 
theoretically, 250 words is one page. It can take you 15 minutes to write, right? So it's a small uh, kind of goal to strive for, but it's a win. And in, when you're writing a book, it is so important to just keep creating wins for yourself. And, and that's a really easy way to do it. Uh, what does my day look like? I wake up and I stretch, I meditate. Um, I, I do that stuff to get my body and my psyche kind of like grounded. And then I sit down and I write, right? So it's uh, it's important to get those words out um, for me anyway, as early as possible, because my mind is as clear as possible in that at that time, right? So I, I'll be able to access uh, the connection points a lot more easily. I'm able to formulate my sentences a lot more easily. I can communicate what I need to communicate a lot more easily on the earlier part of the day. And and then once I feel like, okay, I I, I have my win, the rest of my day goes a lot better too because now I ha- I'm starting the day feeling accomplished. Love that so much. What do you need in your writing space to help you stay focused? Put the phone away. (laughs) That's the number one thing I need because, you know, writing is confusing, right? Writing is confusing. We, we have to make so many decisions as writers that it becomes overwhelming right? So the first thing is uh, eliminate the distractions because when you feel uncomfortable and and confused and overwhelmed, the first thing you'll want to do is, and it's automatic, pick up that phone and scroll, right? And it doesn't feel like such a big thing, but then suddenly it's 15 minutes later and uh, you've lost completely your train of thought. But the, the, the trick with writing is if you can sit in the confusion, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, I guarantee you by second 15, you have an answer. It's that willingness to sit with the questions that creates the answers in writing. So for me, distraction-free environment, which includes no electronics. Uh, If I need to, if I'm on, you know, if I I need to, I'll set a timer, right? So I'll set a timer um, and uh, I have have a Google home. I'll say, hey, Google, (laughs) set a timer for 30 minutes, right? And, And hands off, it'll just tell me. And that that is for my own peace of mind. Let's say I have, uh, I need to go somewhere and I'm, uh, you know, like stressed about time that eliminates that stress. Right. Uh, and then just making that commitment to sitting with the discomfort of not knowing and of the confusion of all of the decisions is one of the most absolutely important things. And it's the, it's the difference. If you're willing to and able to sit in that space for 10 seconds, even 15 seconds, that is the difference between someone who finishes a book and someone who doesn't. Those like next time you're sitting down to write that 15 seconds, those 15 seconds, what you do during those 15 seconds is the difference between whether you finish your book or you don't. That's really powerful. Really powerful. So amazing. Did I answer your question, Courtney? I don't know. Yes. (laughs) I love that. It's such good advice too, because we typically do pick up our phones once we. Absolutely. What is your favorite writing snack and drink? Water. Oh my God. Am I thirsty when I write? I am. I drink water all the time. And, and when I'm writing, 
I am literally parched, completely parched. So I'm drinking, this is a giant glass of water, and I'm drinking multiples of these. When I get up off my <laughs> off my desk, uh, you know, every like 30 minutes or 40 minutes, I'm going downstairs to get a glass of water. I'm so thirsty when I'm writing. And the other thing I like to snack on is uh, some kind of fruit, like cherries I love. Um, I, I typically stay away from anything that would make me kind of tired. Uh, so um, anything heavy, that'll just make me want to go lay down in my bed and read in bed, which is code for let's take a nap for three hours. You know, it's, yeah, not good. Uh, so I, I stay with fruit and tons and tons of water. <laughs> Love that. What type of books do you personally enjoy reading? It's interesting, that question. Uh, the books that I really enjoy reading have shifted. They shift over the years. There was a period of time that I was reading all these epic uh, novels, right? I During that period, I read Les Miserables. I, le I read all of the um, George R. R. Martin books. Uh, I read um, A Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, like all of these kind of like epic type, big <laughs> books. I would read those. And then I entered an era of personal development spirituality in which I was reading, you know, um, uh, Wayne Dyer and Eckhart Tolle and Abraham Hicks and just every, everything like that. I, I read all of, um, uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza's books and, uh, the Journey of Souls and all of these types of books. And I went through this entire phase and I still am kind of like, uh, I, I love those books so much. And uh, many of them I've read multiple, multiple times over the years. And now I'm in my era of professional um, uh, collecting of professional skills, you know, like uh, my atomic habits and all of th those types of books. And part of it is because now a lot of my clients are coaches themselves, they are speakers themselves, they're writing that type of book. And, and I'm gravitating, you know, very much towards that type of book. And, and that's the phase or era that I'm in currently. Love that. Are there any books or authors that inspired you to become a writer? Um, Oh, that's such a good question. I've never gotten that question. Any books or authors that... The interesting thing is, when I was younger, I would go to the library every week, and I would come home with a stack of books. And I was the kid who would sit at a dinner table, you know, like at a dinner party, and be reading a book under the table. You know, like I was, I was that kid or, or we'd be at a family gathering and I'd find the couch in the corner and I'd just like sit there curled up with my book. And the interesting thing is at that time, I think I, uh, I would read ferociously, but I wasn't aware of authors. You know, like I, I would read pretty much everything I could get my hands on, but I almost didn't even like know where these books came from, that somebody wrote them, that it was possible to write a book, like all of all of that part of of the reading and writing process kind of like escaped me. All I knew was that I wanted to escape into these books. Uh, so if there were books that really inspired me, I don't even like remember what specifically they were. I know that uh, during my divorce, I read uh, Stephen King's On Writing. 
And he talks in that book about when he's like 12 years old and he turns this movie, he watches into a, into a book and starts, you know, they didn't know about um, intellectual property. And, you know, and that's, that was his ex first experience of writing a book. And, and I think in that moment, there was an aha moment that uh, there, there was like a light switch that went on in my head that, that was like, oh, I love writing. I've always loved writing. I never thought I could write a book because that gap was never closed for me as a kid, right? That somebody is writing these books and it could be someone like me. Like that, that was never, that was never a association that I had made as a child, right? But when I was 30 and I read Stephen King's book on writing, I think that was the moment when I realized that like what a difference it makes um, whether you are kind of taught that, hey, you can, you you love writing, you can write a book as a child. And, and when you are not given that gift as a child, uh, how long we kind of like look for that permission externally, you know, because I think, um, I think for me, that decision of, can I be a writer myself? Can, you know, like, is this something that I actually can do that? Like, I, I think my whole life, I was kind of waiting for someone to come and tell me I could. And when I read that book, it was like, oh, that that's not going to happen. <laughs> right. I have to give myself that permission. So, so I guess it was that moment when I thought I could do this professionally. Love that. What books did you grow up reading? Did you have an all time favorite? I moved around so much um, that the books I grew up reading probably don't make any sense because I, I lived in Turkey. So I was reading Turkish books. I lived in Germany. I was reading German books. And then I lived in Iran. I was reading per Farsi books in Farsi and Persian. And then when I was in Iran, also my mom would somehow magically find uh, German books so that I would continue, um, uh, you know, remembering German. And it would be these crime thriller <laughs> type books uh, that I would just read. So I don't remember like a particular, particular thing. I, I do remember I did enjoy those crime thriller type books when I was 12 and living in Iran and they, I'm reading these German books and uh, to the point that I started translating them into Farsi. And so I, I decided at some point um, that I was going to translate him. Now, looking back, I feel like maybe that decision was made because I didn't have access to a lot of books. And <clears throat> so I had to entertain myself with the same set of books. And you can't, you know, you can read a book once or twice. And then, and then what, right? <laughs> and then, oh, translate it into another language, you know? <laughs> I love that. That's a... Super, that's super unique. Yeah. On the other side of that, now as an adult, what are your favorite series or authors that if they come out with something, you automatically grab it? Mm, good question. So as an adult, the books that really affected me were books like um, Dune, uh, Solaris, um, uh, Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Like, it's like these, these books just really, I, I remember when I was, um, reading them, they, they affected me. And I, and I felt like I want to write a book like this, you know? Uh, right now the people who come out with books that i immediately will grab uh, are nonfiction writers like mm -hmm. i'll i'll 
grab everything that Brene Brown writes. I'll grab everything that uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza writes. Um, you know, so it's like it's those people that uh, they've affected me in a different way, <laughs> right? So, so the sci-fi writers, uh, like I was so engrossed by their imagination and their ability to communicate very kind of human experiences and truths through science fiction like that that to me was like such a powerful thing you know like George Orwell um his books I I, I love every one of them right um and then with the nonfiction writers their ability to kind of like go deeper into that human experience into the into the spiritual human experience that that is very powerful for me. Love that. What would you tell someone just starting out with reading again? I have a lot. So there's a lot of um, kids these days who don't read. And my nieces, it's heartbreaking. They used to say, and I don't know if they still say it, they're like uh, in their late teens now. But they would say, oh, reading is boring, right? And what I find with reading is you got to find the thing that excites you, that's interesting, because there's nothing more expansive than reading. Reading is telepathy, right? Stephen King calls it telepathy in his book. He's like, this is telepathy. This is like me communicating my thoughts to you across space and time, right? Reading and writing is how we share ideas and ideas amplify when they are shared. Everything that exists in the world is an idea that was shared. Right? Every single thing, this house, that TV, every book that's ever written, the glass you drink out of, the computer through which we're speaking, like every single thing was an idea that was shared. And when it was shared, it was amplified in someone's mind. And books share ideas. (laughs) Books amplify ideas. Books move society forward, right? This is, it's, it's one of the most powerful tools we have at our disposal. And not reading is kind of a tragedy because you're you're keeping yourself small by not reading because you're not allowing yourself to to receive and amplify ideas that really could be transformative and life changing for you and for generations and generations to come. Right? Uh, it's literacy is liberty. <laughs> right? When people don't know how to read and write, we take it for granted. There are still people who can't read and write. And those people are not able to communicate their experiences and they're not able to receive ideas on a deep level because they can't read and write. It's such a powerful thing that we have at our disposal. So all of that to say, read. And if you're trying to get into reading because you're like, ah, oh, reading is boring, you know, like that type of thing, I think find something that interests you. Find ideas that you find um, exciting and then read about those ideas and then go down rabbit holes of reading more things about those ideas, right? There is something that you're interested in that you want to learn about that you you'll have access to thousands of books <laughs> you know but give yourself permission to be expansive because to be a reader is to be expansive to be a writer is to be expansive so give yourself that permission love that on the other side of that what would you tell someone just starting to write their own book Keep in mind that writing is confusing. So 
clarity and momentum, clarity and momentum. So how can I create clarity every single day and how can I create momentum, right? So there were some ways that I create clarity with myself and with my clients is at the beginning of a book, we don't ever edit, right? You got to lock that editor in a closet somewhere. Don't let them out. Send them to Hawaii, right? Until your book is done, right? And when your editor wants to come and go, my dad said, like, uh, no, no. You know what? You go away. So no editing. What that means is you got to allow yourself to create words and put them on the page. It doesn't matter if the words are good, if they're bad, and start wherever the water is flowing, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if you start at the beginning, at the in the middle, or at the end. It does not matter as long as you're generating the words. Your 250 words doesn't have to be chapter one and then chapter two and then chapter three. It can be a random scene that you just thought of in the middle of your book. The idea is you here, here's the thing. If you want to put together a puzzle, which a book is, a book is a massive puzzle. You have to create the puzzle pieces. You don't know how those puzzle pieces are going to go together, right? But you have to create the pieces. And every time you sit down to put 100 pages, 200 pages, 300 pages onto, onto the page, you're creating puzzle pieces. Don't get fixated on, I have this puzzle piece. I have to now create the puzzle piece that goes into it. You don't know how that puzzle is going to be fitting together. Anyways, even if you're writing it sequentially, you're going to get to a point where you realize, oh, actually, this is out of order. This is, has to go here. That has to go there. So so you got to be flexible, right? So be flexible in the writing process, which means allow it to be messy, allow it to uh, be total crap, right? I call my first draft the crap draft. I do that intentionally because I don't want to have any kind of judgment, right? I don't show my crap draft to anyone. It's for me to get my words out so that I know what there is, so I know how that puzzle actually fits in together, right? Mm -hmm. So write every day if you're starting out. Put that editor away. That editor really has no business coming out until your crap draft is completely done. So all of the words, all of the ideas, everything you want to communicate is already on the page. And then uh, go where the water is flowing, right? If, if one section is too confusing, go to another section, write, write something else. Another really great tool to create clarity is journal about your writing, right? So you literally can sit at your journal and say, gosh, I'm trying to get you know, Susie to Bob because they have to have this fight, but Susie like all the way over there, blah, blah, like write out the problem that you're facing, right? It's like, why, why is the writing so blocked? What is creating confusion? Write out the confusing thing that is causing you trouble right now that is causing you to, to feel a block. And it's amazing how magically the the problem starts to solve itself once you name it and once you label it and once you acknowledge it. Love that. What is one thing that people are generally surprised to find out about you? Uh, there, I, I guess there's a bunch of things. I'll tell you a few of them and then you tell me which one's most surprising. My dad was an international con man. So that's part of the reason I moved around a lot. I lived in refugee camps for a year and a half in Germany. I uh, had a dance business for eight years and taught ballroom dancing. Um, 
I've been in on an episode of uh, True TV's uh, Impractical Jokers. It's fun. I mean, are any of these surprising? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of unique circumstances. Yeah, a lot of unique yeah. circumstances. Yeah. Is there anything you would like to say or add? Well, thank you so much, Courtney, for having me on your show. And, uh, and I hope that this has inspired at least one person to read a book and get going on their book. Love that. Where's the best place for readers to find your books? I know some readers love signed copies. Is that an option and the best place to connect with you? Yes. The best place to connect with me is uh, Instagram. You can find me at Brave Ellie. You can also find me on my website. It's ellieshoja.com. That's E-L-L-I-E-S-H-O-J-A.com. And uh, yeah, it's signed copies. Absolutely. If you're in LA, it's super easy. Uh, I can just sign it for you in person. I can also ship it anywhere that you like. Um, yeah, and you can find my books on Amazon. That's the easiest, probably easiest place. Amazing. Well, thank you so, so much for being here today. We're so grateful that we got to interview you. I'll be sure to drop those, those links in the show notes. And again, thank you so much. Thank you for me. Thank you.